There we go. So thank you everybody for joining us. This is the May 2024 installment of the Microsoft Data Platform Continuity Virtual Chapter. This year has been an absolute whirlwind. And with me today is Andrew Presky. Uh, he is going to be talking about our snapshots backups. And I've got my own personal opinion on that, but I know you're <laughs> going to validate it. So with that, I'm going to turn that over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. Okay, let me share my screen. Does that look good? Everyone can see my screen. Fantastic. Okay, welcome everyone to this session, our snapshots backups. I am not Anthony Nocentino. I am Andrew Prusky. Anthony was originally scheduled to do this session. He couldn't make it today. But thankfully, me and Anthony have very, very similar skill sets. We both are principal field solutions architects at Pure Storage, former SQL Server database professionals. I like to think of Anthony as the 1.0 version. When they really released it, there were a load of bugs in it, they got them fixed, and we all ended up with me, the new version. So, and he'll probably kill me for saying that. Um, but anyway, I was a DBA for around 15 years before doing this, specializing in SQL Server, uh, system architecture performance, Kubernetes containers, all that jazz. My contact details are on the slide there, at DBA from the cold on Twitter, my blog, DBA from the cold.com, and my GitHub. And as he has a whole bunch of resources for you for this session in his GitHub account, and I will post a link to the exact repo at the end of the session. So you can grab all the slides, all the demos, play around with them at your own convenience. But onto the session. So what are we going to do today? The, the question at the start was, are snapshots backups? And I'll be honest with you, if you'd asked me two years ago, I would have probably said, absolutely not, not a chance. But technology has evolved. We now have this new feature in SQL Server 2022 called T-SQL Snapshot Backups. So we're going to have a real in-depth look at these things. So we have a look at the anatomy of the full traditional or native SQL Server Backup, the backup that we all know and love. The anatomy of the new T-SQL Snapshot Backups. Then we talk about some use cases. And then we'll have a look to see, is this a backup? And I'm not going to try to convince you. I'm just going to give you the information that you can all make your own mind. And then we'll have a look at some best practices for snapshot backups. One thing I will say is, OK, when we take these snapshots, we are talking about some vendor-specific technologies here on the storage arrays that we're using to take these snapshots. Now, I'm using in the demos that Anthony has provided for me the PowerShell module for Pure Storage to take the snapshot on the Pure Storage Array. But these are available to any storage vendor that allows you to take snapshots of the underlying storage. It's just the fact that our lab, we work for Pure Storage, is in Pure Storage, used in Pure Storage. So that's why, and I'll try and keep this as vendor agnostic as I possibly can, focusing on the actual T-SQL stuff. Um, for, we can also do this in Azure as well. You know, so it's not locked into a vendor, you can do it up in the cloud, anywhere that you can take a snapshot of the underlying storage. So let's talk about the anatomy of a full database backup. This is the backup that we all know and love. And it's basically, as, as was expected, a full backup would take a backup of the whole database that represents the database at the time the backup finishes. So for the example here, we have a very simple database. We have a disk A holding the database files, hopefully not on all one massive NDF file, but I'm pretty sure all the DBAs working here have seen that in the past. But hopefully we've got mobile database files on disk A and our transaction log on disk B. And the red part there is noting the active portion of the log. So what happens when we take the full backup? Well, we get our checkpoint. We then mark that the backup has started, and we write down to a new backup file. And then all our backup header is created, containing metadata of the backup. And then all database files are read sequentially into that backup file. And if you attach a debugger to SQL, you actually see all the database files being read and copied into that backup file. Finally, copy the actual portion of the log into that backup, mark the backup as finished, and update MSDB. Now, there are challenges with this. Databases are not getting any smaller out there. Remember when I first started with SQL Server, terabyte databases were not unheard of, but pretty uncommon. 
But now we're starting to see databases in terabyte, 10 terabytes, 100 terabytes in size. I actually worked with a customer last week who had a 220 terabyte SQL Server database. Um, they were actually asking about getting that database into Kubernetes. So they had multiple issues going on there. But anyway, these large databases are there. They're out there. And the problem with native full backups is that they are a size of data operation. The bigger your database is, the longer your backup is going to take. And this is going to put pressure on resources on your server, CPU, network, disk, CPU reading through those pages, memory on the server as well, getting into the memory, then before being written to the backup file, network going across the wire to your remote backup location, if it's not local on the, on the server, or consuming resources, more and more pressure, depending on how big that database is. And of course, this will impact your workload. If your CPU is already high, you're going to spike it right up the top when you're reading through this, especially if you do something like enable compression or encryption on that backup. It can impact your workload there. And of course, costs. Where are we storing these database backups? Are we storing them on our same array that our database lives on, our hyper-fast production storage? Hopefully not, but because it's taking up space. Very costly. We probably want multiple copies of these databases as well, all taking up space increasing our storage costs. And this really comes into, into its own when you're in the cloud, because storage up in the cloud can be really expensive. And also, another thing we're seeing here is our recovery time objective. As the databases get larger, as backup and restore times take longer, we're putting stress on our recovery time objective in order to achieve our recovery point objective. And I'm kind of now seeing that RTO is dictated by restore time and not business needs, which is not a good place to be in. So what can we do? Well, let's talk about snapshots. Now, these are a read-only representation of the disk of volume at the time the snapshot is taken. So in Azure, say, point-in-time read-only copy of a virtual hard disk or storage device, point-in-time read-only representation of a volume that is in the server. Now, for pure storage and other vendors out there, they all have these logical entities where you can group volumes together and snap that logical entity so you get, say, your data and your log volumes at exactly the same time. Because if you take a snapshot of your data, voice, uh, data volume and your snapshot of your log volume at different times and you try and attach them, you're going to get inconsistencies and not be able to attach. But we can use these to revert the database to a previous point in time and pretty much instantaneously as well. Snapshots are not a size of data operation. These are instant. We take a snap of the volumes, pretty much instant. And then when we revert, we can do this instantaneously as well. And this is the key benefit for using this technology, in my opinion, is that we're not affected by how large those databases are. The 20 terabytes, 200 terabytes, get even bigger. Doesn't matter. The snap is instant. And also another really cool thing about technology is dedupe technology out there. Multiple storage vendors will dedupe snapshots down. So if you take a snapshot of, say, a 20 terabyte database and have multiple copies of it, those snaps don't actually take any more space on the array. They are deduped down against the original copy of the database, which means you could do some pretty cool things like copy and clone these to provide other access, access to the data. So thinking about shipping them off for test dev, pipelines, doing te performance testing about new store procedures that are coming out, or shipping them off to another array. Loads of technology companies out there allow you to replicate these things to another array for, say, DR purposes. But let's get into the mix of it, and let's talk about, say, the elephant in the room. The I've used snapshots before, and I've been burned by them. Because I'm pretty sure anyone listening out there going, I used snapshots a while ago, and these things didn't work out for me. So let's talk about the different ones that we have, the different types of snapshots that we have available to us. So we have application consistent snapshots, crash consistent snapshots, database snapshots within SQL Server itself, and vendor specific implementation. OK, we're going to run through them one by one. We'll talk about these application consistent snapshots now. Now, for years, the only way of doing this is with VSS. We're requiring 30 party tools to coordinate the snapshot activity with the underlying storage platform. Uh, hands up here, who likes VSS? 
uh, not many people, mainly because it's slow to execute and it results in long IO stuns of the database. In order to get an application consistent snapshot, we have to stun, quiesce, freeze IO on that database in order to take that application consistent snapshot. We take the snap and then we thaw IO, allow it to resume. Now this can cause problems. Now I've been lucky where I've worked where developers have put retry logic into their application to say, oh, hang on, that database isn't available. I'm gonna back off, wait, and then retry. Now this was actually done for um, AG failovers, but it works for stunning the database as well. The other problem, uh, uh, sorry. So that works with the retry logic, but I've also worked with applications that as soon as the database is unavailable, it just started spamming errors like there was no tomorrow. And we have to go in and reinitialize once the database had come back online. So these long IO stuns can be a real problem when it comes to taking application consistent snapshots. So the other option is crash consistent snapshots. Now, I absolutely love crash consistent snapshots because if you follow right ahead login like SQL Server does, like Postgres does, you will always get a recoverable DB. Now, crash consistent just means we're not stunning the database at all. We are just snapping the volumes as they are at a point in time in the database, taking them, and then we can present them back to the same server, a different server, attach the database with the syntax of create database, database name with the files, with for attach. Bring the database online, running through its recovery process because right ahead logging is used. So SQL will roll through any commit transactions in the log that are in the data file and roll back any uncommitted transactions that are in the log. And that's a little bit of a problem sometimes. Whereas if you've taken a snap when there has been, say, a long running uncommitted transaction happening, say, an index rebuild on a large table, SQL will need to roll that transaction back before it can bring the database online and in a consistent state. What can we do about that? Well, until 2019, not a lot really, just had to kind of sit there and wait. Um, I once did this with a database where I tried to attach it and it had an ETL pipeline running via SSIS for like five days. And guess what happened with that database? It sat there rolling that transaction back for five days. Nothing you could do. But in SQL Server, I think it was 2019, correct me if I'm wrong, we now have accelerated database recovery that can really help with bringing that database online a lot faster. So if you're looking at crash consistent snapshots, 100% look at ADR. Downside of crash consistent snapshots, no point in time recovery. We just get the database files as they are at the point in time the snapshot is taken. So all we can do is attach those database files. We can't actually bring the database up in say restoring mode and then apply more transaction log backs from the top of it. So that's the key difference between application consistent and crash consistent. Application consistent needs to stun, but it allows us to do point in time recovery. Crash consistent, no point in time recovery, no stun, but we can just attach the files as they were. But we have also other options. We have database snapshots. Now these, I can't remember the last time I actually used database snapshot within SQL Server. It's all built into the instance. There's no portability whatsoever. And we don't really use them because you get performance challenges due to the copy on write when you're running in. So for that thing, I haven't used database snapshots oh, for, for at least 10 years. I, I must admit, I can't remember the last time, but it's definitely over 10 years ago. And then finally, we have vendor specific implementation. We have things like uh, snapshots, VMware, uh, VM snapshots. Um, I Again, I don't particularly use these. They can be happy for like deploying templates of servers and things like that. But I'm talking about the granularity here. I don't really want to have to snap a whole VM. I want to get into like you know, a database. And sometimes not even I, I don't even want the database. I just want, say, a table within the database. So having like vendor-specific implementation, yeah, it's great, but it's not something I want to use. And you can have, Anthony's got here, consistency, consistency issues and the granularity of restore. That's the key one for me is I don't want the whole VM. I said, I just want a database. So let's dive into those application consistent snapshots with the new stuff that we have in SQL Server 2022. And that would be the T-SQL snapshot backup. Now this gives us the ability to create the database with no external tools because SQL Server is aware and in complete control of that IO stun. We don't have to use VSS anymore. We're not going off to any external tools to perform the stun. We're doing it all within SQL Server, which brings the amount of time we're stunning that database down 
considerably. And of course, we can uh, we can freeze the database, I.O., and then we can resume it if something goes wrong with And we'll have a look at this now with the metadata only back. If something goes wrong like with it, we can unfreeze as well. The snapshot is still done at the storage or service tier. So we freeze I.O. in SQL, go off to our storage layer, take the snapshot, and then resume I.O. with what's known as a metadata only backup. And we'll see all the syntax coming up for that in a second. But this unlocks point in time recovery and gives us the ability to do an instantaneous restore for a database, a group of databases, or the entire server. We have those three options available to us, which is the really cool thing about this, not a size of data operation, no matter how big that database is, this is gonna be pretty much an instantaneous backup and a restore. Because there's no point in being instantaneous for backup if it's gonna take hours to do the restore, we'll lose all the benefits of this technology. So it's instantaneous for backup and instantaneous for restore. And we can also do some really cool things outside of just normal traditional backup and restore. We can do things like seeding availability groups and initializing log shipping. I did a project uh, a couple of years ago, no, must have been longer than I, probably about four years ago, time is ticking on, where we did the SQL Server migration from one domain to another in our production environment. And then we had to go and seed our AGs again. Now, some of these servers uh, had 500, 600 databases in these AGs. Uh, pro tip, don't do that. It was a terrible idea. Failover is a nightmare. But this was just legacy stuff that we had to deal with. And the way to seed an AG was either use the automatic seeding option or backup and restore. We used the automatic seeding option. And the automatic seeding option is, it works, it's fine. It's just, you can't just dump 600 databases into it and expect it to work. It's not going to work that way. We had to do it five databases at a time seems to be the optimum level and then monitor it using the DMVs. Took us about two or three days to get all these servers seeded. If we could have used T-SQL snapshot backups to do this, I would have been laughing. I could have done it in a fraction of the time. So it brings, it gives us the ability to set up a high availability solution in a much shorter period of time. The same with log shipping. Log shipping, been around in SQL Server since was it 2000, I think. So it's tried, tested, bulletproof technology. Um, one of the rites of passage for new DBAs, is fair, I remember this, is you, know, you, you don't use the built-in log shipping, you build your own using the backups and PowerShell. The problem with log shipping is once you have it up and running and you want to do a failover test, you bring those databases online after taking your tail log backups, but then you need to reinitialize it all. And that can involve copying backups to your DR location, restoring, restoring logs over them and sending it all back up. It can take time because this is a size of data operation. Snapshots, again, instantaneous. Snap, replicate the database, replicate the snapshot over to your DR site, bring the databases up. Fantastic stuff. Um, we also have the ability to do cross-platform scenarios here, Windows and Linux. We can, VSS, we couldn't do this on. We couldn't take application consistent on this. It was Windows-based. So we took, we can now take these snapshots on Windows and ship them to Linux and bring the database up there. So we can have nodes and AGs on different areas, obviously, if it's clusterless. But we can do some really cool things with this technology going across Windows to Linux, Linux to Windows. And then the final point there, I think I've mentioned before is that it is fast, really fast, especially when you compare it to VSS. The demo that we're doing later, we're gonna see how quick we can get this down. And in fact, in the demo, we could even make it even shorter if we wanted to, because we're doing it remotely from a jump box. Um, I'll talk about that when we get to the demos. But then let's have a look at these snapshot backups. How, what do they actually look like? So we have our database, disk A with its files, and we have just be with the transaction log and the active portion of the log. So backup starts off exactly the same as a normal traditional backup. We have our checkpoint. And then we mark, mark that the database backup has started. Differing now, we freeze, quiesce, um, whatever, free, freeze, quiesce. There was another one that's done, was the word I was looking for, the database and the log file. When I say stun, freeze, quiesce, well, however you want to freeze it, what I'm talking about is stunning write IO. We're not st stunning read IO here. It's only write IO that is stunned, which makes sense if you think about it. Why bother stunning read IO? It's not going to affect the database files, really. 
we just need to stun any writes coming into that database file. So we freeze it, perform a snapshot at the storage layer. So we've got snapshot zero there with the database files and the transaction log and the active portion of the log in it. We write a metadata file. Now this is a new type of backup with new syntax available to us in 2022. That describes what is in that snapshot. We saw the database and log, so write comes back in. He's got read write in there, but just write. And we mark that the backup has finished. And then finally, update MSDB. And then we can continue taking log backups as we normally would. Database is back online. There we go. So let's have a look at this new syntax that is available to us in SQL Server 2022. So how do we suspend the database? Well, it's all this new syntax. We say for D the database DB1, we say alter database DB1, set suspend for snapshot backup equals on. And that will freeze the database for us, allowing us to take the snapshot at the storage layer, Azure, storage layer, storage array, the hypervisor, however we want to take this snapshot. And then we take what's known now as a metadata only backup. New syntax again for us. We back up the database to disk with a keyword metadata only. And that, once finished, unthaws the database for us, resumes IO on us. And he's got a note of sure saying that We've got a media description optional here. Now it's not required, but a bit of best practice for you is to drop in the snapshot name and the snapshot location so that it goes into this backup file so we can read from it and find out where the snapshot related to this backup metadata file is located. Now, a few things to mention with this. Copy only is available for T-SQL snapshot backups. And we have the ability to monitor IOSTAN. We have a new server property called suspended database count tells the amount of databases at any one time that are suspended for a snapshot backup. And we have a new database property as well called is database suspended for snapshot backup. So we can check to see if that database is currently being frozen for a backup being taken. We can monitor stuff in a DMV, DM service suspend status, and that provides info on database stuns, the session stunning, and the suspend time. And also, when we actually run these things, when we set that suspend for snapshot backup on, we can also switch it off, by the way. If that backup metadata file, uh, if that ba metadata backup, sorry, fails, we can actually, and the only reason it would fail is probably because the location we're trying to back up to doesn't exist. We can actually say set suspend for snapshot backup off. So we've got complete control over that snapshot stun. What's actually happening in the background here when we do this is three, say we're backing up one database. We actually get three locks being taken in the background. We get a shared lock on the master database and only one of these is taken regardless of however many databases are being stunned, for example, a group or server stun. We get an exclusive lock on the target database, which comes up as bulk or backup freeze if you have a look in sys DM tran locks. And then we get one shared lock on the target database as well. So for one database, we get three locks, for, and then it's one lock on the master, two lock on each database that is being stunned. And you can all monitor that in SysDM tran locks. So we have complete control over what is happening when we run this process, and it can be monitored quite um, thoroughly as well. Okay, so let's have a look at that backup metadata file. What exactly is that? And as you might expect, it describes what's in the backup. It pretty much is what would be in a backup header file with a little bit more information in there. Now, you must protect this metadata file, but you do this anyway with your backups. So if you're using enterprise backup, it's the same as protecting your usual SQL Server native traditional backups. Now, it's not the end of the world that if you lose this file, because if you don't have this file, you still have your snapshot. So you can still recover your database from the snapshot. You'll just lose the ability to do a point in time recovery. So if you have this, protect it with the normal way you would do your backups, copy it to various different locations. Don't keep it in one say, central location, but it's only gonna be in say the kilobyte range. So it's a lot easier to move around and make multiple copies of than say a backup of say, a 20 terabyte database. 
And as mentioned before in the previous slide, use the media description to locate your snapshot and name, just so that we don't have to trawl through our storage array looking for snapshots going off, say, date and time. We have the information in our backup metadata file that we can read easily to find our database backup. Snapshot, whatever. <laughs> OK, I'm getting confused between the terms now, snapshot backup. OK, right. Now, I mentioned that we can do this for one database. We do this for group databases. We can do it for the whole service. So let's have a look what happens when we take a group backup here. And this is where new syntax comes in again. We can say alter server configuration, suspend for snapshot backup on group, and then list the names of databases that we want. So say we have three databases on this server. We have DB1, DB2, and DB3. DB1 and DB2 share the same disks. DB3 is on its own. But say we want to take a snapshot of just DB1 and DB3. So we'll suspend IO on DB1 and DB3 and take that snapshot on the storage array. That snapshot, because DB2 is on the same disks as DB1, will contain the files for DB2. So what does that mean? Well, DB2 doesn't get IO stun because we have the ability to granular, we have that granularity to go by database here. So what this will give us within that snapshot is that we will get application consistent snapshots of DB1 and DB3, but we also have the ability to use a crash consistent snapshot of DB2. Now that we could do this for various reasons, maybe DB2 has got an application hitting it that's particularly latency sensitive, so we don't want to be stunning IO on it. But I think more in the future that it's going to start us having to think about where we position our databases when it comes to taking these snapshot backups. Do we want DB2 to be in those snapshots for DB1 and DB3? Or do we want to move it onto its own disks to be separate so it's not in all those snapshots there? So it's another thing. We used to think about performance for database layout based on disks and things like that to take high IO databases on their own volumes. Now we maybe need to think a little bit more about how we position our database in terms when it comes to taking these snapshots. Now, I will admit, I'm not sure I'd ever use groups. I would probably do it individually by databases. Or I would use the other option to us, which is the server option when it comes to taking these snaps. So we can say auto server configuration set suspend snapshot backup equals on, and that will freeze IO for all the databases on the server and allow us to take a snapshot of all of those databases at one point in time, meaning that we get the snapshot with all the database files in there, and they're an application consistent snapshot for all of those databases. So we get that point in time recovery for all of them, which I think is a more, you, this is probably the more common way I'd use it. I'd either use individually by a database, taking those snaps, or the entire server, I'm thinking about it. I'm not too sure about group. Now, your mileage may vary. You may have servers out there that, yes, absolutely, will take the snapshot of certain databases and remove just one or two that maybe can't be snapped because of that latency issue, or they're just small enough that we just take native backups off anyway. Okay, great. All right, so I've banged on about these backups, but as Paul Randall once said, you don't have a backup strategy. You have, guess what? A restore strategy. So how do we restore these things? Backups are completely pointless if you can't restore them. So say we have our database here, we have it on disk A and disk B. We want to restore this database. So first thing to do is we offline the database. In SQL Server, we take it offline. And then we offline the volumes on the server, getting rid of them completely. We grab our snapshot, a copy, clone, and present the volumes in that snapshot back to the server. Run the restore we bring the database for the data. Sorry, we run the we online the volumes. The database files are on those volumes, and then we run a restore statement with the new syntax metadata only that will bring that database either immediately online or we use the no recovery option to bring it into a restoring state. At that point, we can mark it as restoring and apply more transaction log backups to that database in the restoring state, giving us that point in time recovery. So that's me harping on about these things a little bit. Let's actually have a, a demo and let's see this in action. So let's switch into 
the demos. Okay, so what we have here is one SQL Server running SQL Server 2022 with one 3.5 terabyte database. And we're going to do this all in PowerShell. So we're going to use DBA tools. And to take the snapshot, because we're running on pure storage, we're going to use the pure storage PowerShell module. And other, other providers have the similar things. It's just because of the platform we're on. But I'm going to keep focused on the process here, not the individual vendor-specific stuff. So off we go. And the first thing we're going to do is I want to highlight here, we're going to set some variables. But on line 16, we're going to use the DBA tools commandlet connect DBA instance to open up a connection to the SQL instance and then hold that connection open. If I use, say, invoke SQL command to say run the freeze for the database, that would go off, run the freeze, and when the SQL command finishes, it would then close the connection. And SQL, thankfully, is smart enough to go, hang on, that connection closed, it froze the database. I'm going to unfreeze the database so that no lingering freezes will actually remain on the instance. But that's not what we want here. We want to keep that freeze open so we can take our snapshot. So that's why we're using Connect DBA instance here to open a connection to the database, run the freeze, keep the connection open so that we can then take our backup metadata only backup, sorry, and that will eventually unfreeze it. So that's why we're using that here. So we go back in and three, two, one. We can see we've got our instance here and we're gonna use the FT demo database, which is the 3.5 terabytes in size. It's running some variables here just so that you can connect into the storage array. And let's have a look at some information about that database. So we've got the database FT demo here and yeah, Anthony, you could have put a couple of divided by 1024s in there. But if we have a look at it, three, four, four, yep, it's about just under 3.5 terabytes in size. OK, so here we go. Let's freeze that database. Alter database, FD. Oh, sorry. Getting ahead of myself. Let's connect into the flat. Let's connect into the storage array there. Wait for it. There we go. OK, now we are ready to freeze the database. So we're going to say alter database, FD demo, set suspend for snapshot backup on. Three, two, one. Using verbose there so we can see IO is now frozen under session 61. And now we can go and take that snapshot. And this is vendor specific, but we're just taking a snapshot of the database on the storage array. We've got the snapshot. And we can now go ahead and take our metadata only backup. There it is, to disk, metadata only. And he's using the media description there, the snapshot name and the array name as well, so we can locate. But one thing to point out here, we have a look at the process pages for that database there. Zero pages processed. So metadata only backup. This is not a size of data operation. So instantaneous here. We freeze the database, take the snapshot, instantaneous operation, and then take the metadata backup. Again, pretty much instantaneous operation. We completed in what? 0 0.005 seconds. Great stuff. OK. So we have that database back. And that is the process. Freeze, snapshot, metadata backup. We'll have a look in the SQL Server error log to have a look to see what SQL Server thinks. There we go. We've got our BKM file there. Was it 22 kilobytes? Nice and easy to move that around to protect because we want to get that kind of off, basically protecting as our normal, basically protecting as our normal backups, multiple copies of it. So that if we lose one, we've still got it there. But again, if we lose that metadata backup, it's not the end of the world. We still have the snapshot on our array that we can use. We just lose that ability to do point in time recovery. And then in the error log there, we can see IO is frozen and then IO is resumed on database. One weird little thing there, if you have a look, you can see IO is frozen. And then when it's resumed, it also says IO is frozen, IO is resumed at the same time. Um, OK, so it took, what, about 23 seconds there? And that's because we just go in, snap, we were talking through it, looking at each individual section. What we'll do in a little bit here is once we run through a restore, we'll do another one and we'll see how short we can get this down. OK, there we go. And he's highlighting there, database backed up, backup database successfully, which is what we usually see when we do a normal backup. And then we can see that the database is also recorded in the MSDB as a full backup. Three, two, one. There we go. Full 1.3 tera, 1.3. 
three nine terabyte. This database three point five in size, but only had actually about uh, one point four terabytes of data actually in it. You're going to read the backup header from that backup metadata file, giving us a whole bunch of information in there. Whole load of stuff there. But if we scroll up, we can see it'll say is snapshot. Come on, up we go. There it is. Yes. Snapshot true. And then it's all the information we typically see from a normal backup header. Excellent stuff. So we have our full snapshot backup. Now let's take a log backup. Backing up to a share that service can see. There we go. We've got our log backup. There it is. All right. So now let's simulate someone coming along and doing something daft, say dropping a table in production. Now, no DBA in the history of the world has ever dropped a table in a production database thinking they were working on, say, some sort of staging environment. So we've dropped that table. We need to get it back. Now, if this was, say, a normal uh, traditional way of recovering, we I typically would do this side by side or on a different server. You don't want to do a whole database restore just to get one table back. Bring it up side by side, grab the table data, push it back in. This can take some time, especially on a 3.5 terabyte database when we wait for the full backup to restore, the differential backup to restore, and then rolling through those logs. But let's see the difference here when we go and do this with this T-SQL snapshot backup. So he's just getting some information here about name, size, last full backup, last log backup. And let's come on, let's go ahead and let's run through this restore process. So as we mentioned, the first thing to do is offline that database. We're gonna do, we're gonna overwrite the existing one, get rid of it. Take that database offline. There we go and then offline the volume that that database lives on. Now, for simplicity's sake, he's done this, all database data and log files on the same volume. Typically, we'd have our databases on multiple data files, uh, sorry, multiple volumes. But for this demo, just for simplicity's sake, everything is on the one volume. And now what he's going to do is retrieve some information from the backup header using that media description to find out the snapshot name and where it is located. So three, two, one. So best practice, so we can read from that backup file where we're located, and that's just the array name and the, and the snapshot name. So what we can do is now plug that into our PowerShell script that will overwrite the volume with that snapshot using those variables. Three, two, one, boom, again, instantaneous operation here. Online the volume. Next one, and then online the database. So what we're doing is restore database, from disk, the backup file, with a new keyword again, metadata only, and then replace with no recovery. So when it goes reverse, there we go. Process zero pages, not a size of data operation. Check the state of the database. It'll be in restoring mode. Wonderful. And then we can restore a log backup over the top of it. It really loves his DBA tools commands. I would have done invoke SQL command. Apparently it doesn't matter. Invoke DBA query at this point. But there we go. He's using it here. We've restored our log. And now we're going to recover our database. Restore database with recovery. There, there it is. And then run that selection. And then, of course, the thing we want to check is that is that table back? Fingers crossed. Hey, there it is. Excellent stuff. So that's how we can recover one table from a snapshot backup. I mean, with we're talking of pauses. I mean, that's fairly quick. But let's see how fast we can actually get this. So we're going to set a couple of variables. Start, freeze the database, take the snapshot, take the metadata backup and then set another variable with the get date. We'll see how fast we can actually get this. So off it goes. There we go, 700 milliseconds. Now that's backing up a 3.5 terabyte database 
in 700 milliseconds, which, to be fair, I think is fairly impressive. Now, I did mention at the start of this that we could probably get that down even quicker because he's doing this from a jump box, going off to the SQL instance and going off to the storage array. You could move all this stuff onto the SQL instance itself, run it locally, and remove one of those network calls, bringing that 700 milliseconds down even further. But I still think 700 milliseconds, 3.5 terabytes, pretty darn good if you ask me. Uh, before we go to the next session, are there any questions? Right now, I don't see any. If anybody has any questions, please do not hesitate to drop them in the chat window here. But uh, this is seriously impressive. <laughs> That's think, really I, cool. This, yeah, in 700 milliseconds, I, I, I'm I pretty happy with that. Yeah, you can bring it, as I mentioned, you can bring it down even short, but like as opposed to waiting, let's be honest, probably hours to get a 3.5 terabyte database backed up the traditional way, take the stun. Absolutely take the stun, and then you've got your backup there. Remember, reducing your R reducing the RTO time to achieve your RPO. And that's what we're really getting at here, is the ability to get this data back as fast as we possibly can. OK, so if there's no questions, let's move on to the next segment. Oh, let's go in again. So is this starting to look like a backup? I mean, we can recover a database nice and easily. We can do some really cool things with it. But say we have SQL Server 1. SQL Server 2, and we've got a DR site as well. We've got three storage arrays with our database here. One of the cool things about the snapshot stuff is that vendors have this really cool way of being able to replicate snapshots across their arrays as well, giving us that extra protection for our snapshots. Because that's one thing that always got me was, hey, I've taken snapshots of this database, but they live on my primary array. Like, what happens if I lose that array? Isn't that a single point of failure? But now we can take the snapshots and we can replicate them across to a secondary array in a secondary data center or wherever in our DR center as well. So we have our database files here. Database files here, we can clone them, mark them as restoring, clone them, mark as restoring. Is this starting to look like a backup? Is it? What do you think? Now, one thing I do want to point out with these snapshots, and that is snapshot retention. I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier that snapshots vendors have this really cool dedupe technology these days that will basically zero out these snapshots initially. The snapshot will take no extra space on the array whatsoever because it'll dedupe down. It's basically just a copy of, it's not a copy, sorry. It's probably just metadata pointed at blocks on the array. But what will happen over time, those snapshots will start to take space up. So, I honestly would implement snapshot backups with normal SQL Server native backups because sometimes we need to retain our backups longer than probably is feasible to keep them on our primary storage array. And this could be for regulatory purposes. We need to retain data for however long. And that is where these things kind of become a problem because I can't really hold snapshots on my primary storage array, taking up my super fast storage space for, say, years at a time. For, in, for being able to roll back to the last known, known point in time, say over a week, maybe even over a month, fantastic stuff. But over like, say, years, months, no, maybe not so much. So that's just one thing to watch out with these things. But are they starting to look like a backup if we can do this type of stuff with them? Let's move on. Let's have another uh, look at Let's have a look at seasonal availability group. And let's have another look at that setup that we had there because we were just one step away from sorting an AG out. We have our storage array one. We have our disk A and disk B. We're taking snapshots with our metadata backup. We're replicating over, we're replicating over. We're copying, cloning, bringing the databases up into restoring. We're only missing one thing here. And that is, boom, setting an AG over the top of that array. So no mucking around. Let's jump back into a demo and let's have a look at how we can seed an availability group using snapshot backup. So jumping in to slide here, let's press play. We have an AG here. I shall talk before we play it. We have two servers here, A and C, with an AG setup. It's a clusterless AG because it's in the lab. And it's looking like it's got uh, warnings there not synchronizing. The reason it's saying not synchronizing is because there are no databases in it. 
So let's go ahead and see how we can use these things to easily seed an availability group. And again, we're going to use this FT demo. This is a 3.5 terabyte database in size. And we're going to again use DBA tools to hold that connection open so that we can take our snap. So we're going to set the primary and secondary servers, connect to both of the instances, and import some credentials just so that we don't have to type out our credentials when we connect into this storage array. Connecting into the array, and this is the primary array. He's got both nodes of this AG on different storage arrays. We're going to freeze that database again. You can see IO is frozen. And then we're going to take that snapshot of the protection group. So we're going to take the snapshot. The protection group is the logical entity we have on, prime, on pure storage. And what he's doing here, just to point out, on line 38 and 39, he's saying, take the snapshot of the volumes and then replicate them instantly over to the secondary array where the secondary node is located. So that one node is on one array, one node is on the other array. OK, so now we're going to take that metadata only backup. So we should one, boom, again, Zero pages processed, not a size of data operation. OK, so we have our, we stunned the database, took the snapshot, took the metadata only backup. We are good to go. But again, we're going to do some vendor specific stuff here just to make sure that snapshot has been replicated from one primary array to the secondary array. So that's all that's happening here. Writing a bit of PowerShell just to say, hey, is that snapshot replicated fully? over to the secondary array. And we'll just wait a little bit. Make sure there we go. And completed, all good. So we have the snapshot on both of the arrays now. I'm going to check the names of them. Make sure they're all good. Yep, 36, 36. And then, OK, we're going to go through the restore process here. So we don't have to offline the database on the secondary node because it's not there. All we have to do is online the volumes and then overwrite. So that's why there's no database offline here, as opposed to what we did in the first one, where we were recovering data from a database that already existed. No database on the secondary at this point. So we can just offline the volumes that we're going to overwrite with that snapshot that's been replicated from the primary array to the secondary array. Here we go. And then this is just the syntax on pure storage to overwrite a volume, you P2F, uh, PFA2 volume. I'll never be able to say that right off the top of my head, no matter how long I work for pure. Online the volume. And then we're restoring the database from our metadata only backup. Replace, no recovery. There we go. Very, very quick. Cool, final thing to do, take a log back up on the primary and then restore on the secondary. There we go again. We've got it up. And now we can add that database. Oh, we set in the seeding mode on the secondary to manual, by making sure. And then we're adding the AG. We're, sorry, we're adding the database into the availability group. Start data movement on the secondary. And now let's go have a look. Three, two, one, do a refresh. And there is our database on our secondary, fully synchronized. Do a refresh there as well. And then the, the report should change there as well when you refresh it. But there we go. We've got our database all synced up. There, that's the last thing I was looking for, making sure everything goes green. Now that is using these snapshots. And I think one of the real benefits of this technology, even if you're not going to use it for your backups, is the ability to pretty much instantly seed secondary replicas using this technology. Otherwise, we'd be using backup and restore, size of data operation, having to copy those backups over to our secondary location, run through the restore of the full database backup, and then any log backups that were taken in the meantime. Or we could have used the automatic seeding function, which, OK, it's fine, does work. It probably worked fine in this room. So we're only doing the one database. But if you're doing a lot of databases, 
you have to monitor that DMV and it they do just drop out and it doesn't tell you anything. You just have to monitor and then go and reinitialize the whole process. Using this process, this functionality, you can get your high availability solutions up and running in a much shorter period of time. So you're not at that, you know, you're not in, at risk of saying having a single point of failure for a lot less period of time getting this up because you can get this up and running so quickly. Okay, are we all good? Any questions? I think we're good. No questions uh, again. If anybody has any questions, let us know. Uh, but quite honestly, you are answering the questions that I have as they pop into my head. So this is great. Ah, right. uh, fantastic stuff. That's always good to know when you. It's, no, it's a sign that I've written my presentation well. Then exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Let's move on. So let's talk about some best practices for these these backups now. The main thing that gets me with these and it makes people nervous is that IO stun. People don't like say, hey, I'm going to freeze IO on my database. Purely for some applications really don't like it. But if you don't like it, do it between your, do it in your normal backup window. Or let's have a look at the application. Can you put some retry logic in there? So it comes up, oh no, database is stunned for that period of time, back off and then come back in. Remember, we're getting this down. We're talking, what, 700 milliseconds? We can bring that down even further. So it is a really short period of time. But yes, I, before anyone says that, this is the Achilles heel that people just don't like that IO stun. But there are things you can do to mitigate. And I will highlight that this is a write stun only. The most common wait I've seen while this is happening is a write log wait. So it's not a big game. So think about the workloads here. Think about massive data warehouses, typically the biggest warehouses, the biggest databases that we see in SQL Server, these gigantic things that are generally sitting there, having SSIS pipelines hitting them, pumping them full of data, but they're mostly just serving up reports or, um, yeah, basically serving up reports for people to make business analytic decisions. Those are perfect for these types of backups, where it's really read heavy, where you can take that IO stun take the snapshot backup, and then take your metadata backup. Really, really good for that type of workload. Um, the next one, protect your metadata files. I mentioned this before, have them protected like you would any other backup file. But again, remember, it's not the end of the world if you lose them. You'll just lose that eye or the ability to perform the point in time restore. So, okay, not great. But it's not the end of the world. You still have that snapshot there with your database files in it. Replicate your snapshots to other physical systems, locations, and media types. One hundred percent. Because again, when I started using these, I was like, hang on, I'm taking the snapshot. It's on my primary storage array. How if I lose that storage array? Okay, if you talk to if you talk to storage vendors, they'll talk to you about our our arrays of like four nines, five nines, appeared six nines of uptime. It's not going to happen. Still makes me nervous. I'm a DBA. I am planning for the worst, hoping for the best. So replicate those snapshots onto other arrays, get them out of your primary data center anywhere, 100%. Make sure that you haven't got that single point of failure for your snapshots. It's the same as your backup files. Don't just have one copy of them, have multiple copies of them as much as you can get. And storage vendors these days have a load of cool technology running in the background to easily replicate snapshots to other physical systems. I mentioned with uh, the crash consistent snapshots, uh, use accelerated database, data, reco database recovery to bring that time down. Say if you have a long running transaction in the snapshot, that'll bring the database online in a far shorter period. I 100% all day will recommend to my customers looking at pure storage that they look at crash consistent snapshots because there's no impact on the server, on the database whatsoever. It's just snapping in the background. So there's no point not having them set up, have them running in the background. So if you ever want to use them, they are there. And 100% switch on ADR. Snapshot retention, this is what we talked about, does equal costs. So I use these in parallel with SQL Server native backups. Have these as your instance database recovery. If you need to go back like a day, a week to get that data back, these are what you should be using. But so you need to retain them for any, need to retain the data for any longer period of time, 100% native backups get shipped off somewhere. Because these things do reside on your primary, secondary storage arrays, taking up that space as they get older. So that is just something to watch. Actually, when I did the, um, 
migration project a while ago, we actually used crash consistent snapshots to migrate over. We weren't on 29. 2022, we were on 2019, 2017. We used crash consistence to migrate from one domain to another. And the storage, uh, my uh, storage admins very nicely gave me access to the arrays to be able to take these snapshots. But guess who didn't clean his snapshots up? And after about a month, I got a very, very, I'm going to say, um, curt email, uh, sorry, direct message on Slack from one of the sys admins. It was like, Andrew, can we delete these now? Because they kind of taking up quite a lot of space on our primary storage array. So yes, just be careful with that. I mentioned when we were talking about, say, the group and the server back uh, options for these T-SQL snapshot backups, the data file layer and storage now becomes a little bit more important. Say we want to snapshot DB1, DB3, but not DB2. We might want to move DB2 off onto its own disk so it's not affected, or it's not just in the snapshot itself. This is only for user databases, not system databases. Makes sense, really. System databases generally aren't that big. We can just run the normal backups for those. Although I have seen, I'm pretty sure everyone else has seen out that the MSDB database, if you don't clean it up, can't get into the hundreds of gigabytes in size. So just watch that. And then snapshot only primary AG replicas. And this goes for crash and application consistent. Application consistent, well, you can't actually pause IO on a secondary anyway, but the crash consistent ones as well. People are like, well, I don't want to do anything on my primary. I'll do it on the secondary node of my AG replica. The problem is the way writes are written on a secondary are different to a primary. Writes coming get written down to log, things go into the redo queue, which means that the data file and the transaction log can be out of sync at certain points. If you snapshot them at that point and try and bring the database up, it can just fail immediately or the database can come up and be marked as suspect. So only snapshot on primary AG replicas, which you can only do with the new syntax. And with crash consistent, who cares? It's not going to affect the database in any way, shape, or form. Just snap the primary. So I think that's the question. Are T SQL based snapshots backups? It's starting to look like a backup, right? What do you think? So let's have a review. Let's talk about what do we do? We did a anatomy of the full backup, anatomy of the T SQL snapshot backup, how they differ, a couple of use cases, seen in availability groups, and then the best practices there as well. So we are just coming to the top of the hour. I've got some resources for you here. Um, there's Anthony's contact on Twitter and his blog. There's mine and my blog. There's the link to the presentations where Anthony has the slides and the demos that we did. And then if you want to check out how to run this stuff on pure storage, I'm not going to push it. We have a whole bunch of SQL Server scripts on GitHub as well. And the link at the bottom there is when Anthony did this session with none other than Bob Ward at Pass Summit back in November last year. So if you want to check that out, you get some absolute golden bits of nugget of information from Bob there as well. So more than welcome to check that out as well. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Yeah, now is the time to ask. Um, I have not seen any in the chat window, but again, you are answering the questions as they pop in my head. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I for everybody out there, this is one of those areas that it's not glamorous, it's not sexy, it's not fancy, but at the end of the day, data recovery is what being a DBA is all about, and giving yourself more options, more tools for the toolbox. This is so unbelievably necessary that if you haven't played this, play with it please tinker, explore, learn, because you never quite know when you're going to need this. Oh, 100%. I think um, the, the main point here is when I talk to customers, their, their RTO is now being dictated by how long it takes to back up and restore that database. And it's just not the situation you want to be in. Um, when I do this demo for customers using uh, just crash consistent, I go a little bit dramatic and actually corrupt the database using um, DBCC write page to show them what can actually go wrong and then get the data back using the crash consistent stuff. And you get a lot of people just going, okay, that is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> you can do it. So much fun. Mm. It's part of why I might have, have my test lab here because I like breaking stuff and then I like fixing it with impunity. So nobody yells at me. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. Uh, so I don't see any other questions here other than putting the links in the chat window, which I just did. Uh, so thank
thank you very, very, very much. Uh, as always, we thank you. We appreciate it. If you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. We're more than welcome and happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, reach out to them directly. Reach out to us. And quite honestly, if you have any other sessions that you'd like to see from a business continuity, high availability, disaster recovery, backup and recovery strategy, architecture, that sort of thing down the road, let us know. I, we're nerds. We'd love to even put together for a, a session just for you on a topic that's near and dear to you. So let us know. And with that, I thank you all very much. Thank you.